going to be talking about, this is um, uh, Second Nephi chapters uh, 31 through 33. Kind of give a, a, just a quick overview of, 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 of where we're at again. You know, so basically, you know, a, a lot of things have happened through, you know, the, the family has gone through the desert and so forth. They're now um, here in America. Basically, they, we have, um, you know, Nephi has gone through the, the tree of life and, all, and, and, and gone through all of that information. And this is kind of like, um, you know, some of his closing words here. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are his closing words. Um, these were not in the the main set of plates that were in the stone box. These are part of the small plates of Nephi. So this is where we're getting this, this, this just pure material right from Nephi. And, uh, and it's not even being filtered through, uh, you know, Mormon Moroni at this point in time. And so, and so the first thing that he wants to talk about, uh, by the way, this is from, the, just if you're using the annotated edition of the Book of Mormon, this is on page 96 is where we're kind of starting off with. So you can follow along with this there on uh, page 96. But that basically, um, he talks about um, the need for Christ to be baptized. And I know that there's been, you know, a lot of people go, Why, what would be the point of Christ being baptized if he's already perfect and if the purpose of baptism is to basically, you know, be forgiven of sins? If there was no sin, there wouldn't there be no need for baptism? So why then was he baptized? And Nephi goes in and talks about that. Right. Well, I think one thing that was really helpful when I know when I was little and um, my dad was explaining to us, like, you're getting ready to be baptized. It's not it's not this thing of, oh, you know, the baptized child is the cleanest child in the room and it's magic. Like this water's magic. Right. It's like a potion. It's not so, so much as that. And, and Nephi talks about how it's a witness when you it's a, cov and a witness of this covenant. And that is why one of the reasons why Christ not only was baptized, even though he didn't. He, he was already keeping all the commandments. He had never made a mistake. He had never rebelled against the Father. But here he's making that witness unto the Father that he will be obedient. Right, in the covenant. Yeah. One of the things I'd like to, to bring up about this particular thing is that, is that um, it says he humbled himself before his Father. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that there are, um, in fact, most other religions and other denominations on this, on this planet a lot of them believe in what they call the Trinity. Mm -hmm. You know, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are all one. And, uh, and we understand that obviously differently. But the Book of Mormon actually gives us some of the most clear understanding of, of that there is a difference between the Father and the Son. Even though, um, if you read in, uh, this is the, the very end of uh, chapter 31, mm -hmm. it says, he says, I'm just, the very last uh, little uh, couple of phrases here, it says, the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, which is one God without end. Amen. And so there that's where all the controversy comes in. Yeah, that, that, that's where we had people who have said, well, there, in your own book of Mormon, right there, it says the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost is one God mm -hmm. without end. Okay, but they ignore the entire chapter prior to that. Because in, in, in we have, uh, for example, it says he humbled himself before the Father, and he's obedient to him. Uh, which, which brings, obviously, the question, how can you be obedient to yourself? Right. So How can you humble yourself before yourself? So the symbolism is so important of the oneness. And the other term that's used all the way through the scriptures that means oneness is in. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Yeah. So when you hear those words, one or in, you're talking about becoming the same. Mm -hmm. So the gospel is about, at the end of the day, you know, <laughs> at the end of the day, what matters is, is, is are we going to be happy? Are we going to have joy? And the way to have joy is by becoming more and more, inching towards becoming more like the Father. Yeah. Because if we're like the Father, then we're capable of having the joy that he has. And so yeah. becoming one, the idea that the Son becomes one with the Father and shows us how to do that so that at the end of the day, it's not about him becoming one with the Father. It's about how do we follow that same path mm -hmm. and change and become like the Father so that we can have joy. That's actually, that's the meaning of the word atonement, which I think is really interesting. At atonement atonement yeah. is something people just throw around, like, oh, right. I apply the atonement, the atonement thus. Well, the atonement, it's a, the breakdown of the word means at one 
movement. It means to become one with God, where you think the same, you act the same, you dress the same, you would, if, if, you would think, yeah, yeah, exactly. You become, and, and that came from William Tyndale because he was sitting there translating. He's like, how do I convey this thought? How do I convey (laughs) this thought of becoming one? He's like, why don't I just say it in English at one Meant. Meant. So yeah. the atonement is how we become exactly like the Father. It's not just something to ban- a band aid for hard days. <laughs> it's like it's yeah. it's how how yeah. do we become exactly like the Father? And I think that's very important. I, th- I think it's in Doctrines of Salvation by Joseph Filling Smith. He talks about how if Jesus Christ and the Father were to come into the room, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference mm-hmm. between them. They're mm-hmm exactly the same and that's why jesus christ told his disciples he was he said if you've seen the father you've seen me and so of yeah. course the evangelical so they look, they look, or some others they yeah. misinterpret that as saying okay well they're the same person they're not they're two separate beings but mm-hmm. to know the one is to know the other verse 9 it says again it showeth unto the children of men the straightness of the path and narrowness of the gate by, by by gate by which ye should enter so uh you know but going back to christ one of the reasons why he was baptized, even though he had no, no, um, you know, need because of sin to be baptized for atonement or remission of sins, but he did it for really he kind of, they give us kind of two reasons: number one, to be obedient to his father, and number two, to be an example to everyone else. Mm-hmm. And that's what it talks about right here: that uh, he he having set the example before them. I think it's interesting because that's, baptism is a pretty simple thing. And it's funny that we can even mess that up and, you know, and, and get to the wrong idea of baptism, right. not by immersion, but by sprinkling and so forth. But, um, but that's you know, really pretty, pretty straightforward. Mm-hmm. It's a straight, it's a, you know, well, straight, straight path, basically, straight. in a narrow gate. Key is it's S-T-R-A-I-T, right? So straight as in narrow, mm-hmm. as in a straight, as in... It's the narrowness of the path and the narrowness of the way and the narrowness of the gate and the mm-hmm. narrow. It's always narrow, meaning yeah. there's one way. And right. the reason why that's important in our day is there's so there there's this really false philosophy that goes around that talks about how there's some you know what's your path to God? We all have our different just ways to get to God and yeah. what's your truth and this well this is my truth that's your truth and Nephi is being really clear. He's like there's one way guys there's there's one way it's straight it's narrow it's not a big road that you're like well which one do you want to try do you want to try that path or this path there's there's one path to God and it's very specific and it's very important because in verse 10 I love how Nephi says he says follow Jesus Christ um can we follow him save we shall be willing to keep the commandments yeah so that is the greatest sign if we ever want to know like how close am I to God, how cl- how how close am I to following Jesus Christ? Well, how well are you keeping the commandments? How mm-hmm. exact? How straight is mm-hmm. your actions? And I think the key to that is, you know, most people would say, "Well, I I've gone to church my whole life, so right. I know what the commandments are." There's ten or something, <laughs> <laughs> right? But it, we're not talking about that. What mm-hmm. we're talking about is right. we need to know Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. right? We need yeah. to study His life study his teachings. Where are most of his teachings? Well, frankly, in the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. And right? more quotes from Christ than any other Right. Scriptures. So, I mean, the most of the entire Doctrine and Covenants is Christ speaking, like, first person. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right? So, certainly, those are the words of Christ. So, are we familiar with those revelations? Do we know right. them? Because how are we going to follow Christ if we mm-hmm. don't know his word? Right? Like mm-hmm. he said, how knoweth the man, the shepherd, that he, you know, right? And so you've got to know his word and then follow it. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of a really a prerequisite because, again, just another kind of anecdotal story. But, uh, but I remember uh, somebody talking about how um, there, were, there were two, two good, good men who had died and they went up to the pearly gates, basically. And, uh, and, the, and, and you know, the, the, as the story goes, basically, you know, so right. seeing Peter comes out, you know, he's, he's saying, so uh, what can you tell me about, about Jesus Christ? And the guy says, well, I can tell you a lot about it. You know, I mean, I was, I was, a, right. you know, I was a, you know, a preacher and I did this and I did that and so forth. And, right. he, and he gives him about his life and his times and about the atonement and so forth and so on. And he said, that, and, and, and then St. Peter says, that's, that's very good. 
okay, go go ahead and, and, and move in, kind of thing. And then the next guy comes up, and the person and, and the the guy the guy comes up to him and says, uh, I've already I've already messed this up. <laughs> but the guy comes up to him and says, What can you tell me about Jesus Christ? And the man looked at him and immediately fell to his knees because he was in his presence. That's the difference of knowing about Christ right. and knowing Christ. Right. And that's and that that that's basically, you know, um you know, one of the things that we are here in this life to do is to come to a knowledge of Christ, but also come to a knowledge not 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 just about him, but to know him. Right. And that's not an easy thing necessarily. <laughs> There's a lot of sacrifice and things that has to happen, but it it's worth you it. You have to live it to be able yeah. to right. know him. You can't right. you just you, you can't without walking in someone's shoes you don't you have <laughs> yeah. to experience it. And I think that's why when you look at um history, a lot of people say, Oh, it's hard to know how did Jesus Christ live? Like what kind of a father was he? What kind of a mm -hmm. brother was he? What kind of a neighbor was he? Well, we just don't actually have a whole lot in the New Testament. That's why I personally love the fact that we know from many statements from presidents of the church that Joseph Smith is the second greatest prophet next to Jesus Christ. That's um, countless statements. Mm -hmm. And so, and we have so many stories about what he was like, actually just learning what who what kind of what was his personality what would he have done if he was in a room how did he pray how did he play with the boys you know all the all all of this about him and anyway so i'm just going to throw that plug in that's a really and i know so many people who have told me that they've actually come closer to jesus christ by studying joseph smith yeah but. because he did em emulate the life and the you know, the the teachings of mm -hmm. christ in, in in a very profound way um, so, so if we go over here, now I want to bring this out because again, we just I, I, I touched about this just in the mm -hmm. very very beginning about you know this whole Trinity concept, right. and uh, and here we have in the Book of Mormon in verse eleven it says, and the Father saith, but then in verse twelve, and also the voice of the Son cometh unto me saying, so he's actually separating these two out, the Father and the Son, and if you look at this and it says that the the Father says to repent, repent. Be baptized in the name of my beloved son. Yeah. But then the son, what does he say? He says, he that is baptized in my name, meaning Christ, to, get, to him will the Father give the Holy Ghost. Let me take that to another level. Because yes. he's saying, not only as he, he's not just saying this, oh, the Father said this sometime. Right. It's very clear right here that Nephi is saying, look, the voice of the Father came to me yeah. and That's said, that repent ye repent ye right so mm -hmm. so he's actually this is an experience nephi's had mm -hmm. and that's a very profound thing right you know in the entire history of the earth the only time we have on record of the father actually coming to someone physically is joseph smith in mm -hmm. the sacred grove that's why it's the greatest vision that mm -hmm. we have in all of scripture mm -hmm. It's greater than any other vision. That's the only time the Father came down himself. But here we have the next best thing, the voice of the Father speaking to Nephi. Which tells you a little bit about who Nephi was mm -hmm. to be able to have that experience. And just, and, like, just like Joseph Smith, yeah. Right, right. And we only have a small plate, so it would be really fun to get all the rest of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. And it, it, it actually, it, it funny because it actually does it again in verses 14 and 15. Right. The behold, uh, for behold, my beloved brethren, thus, thus came the voice of the Son. And then in verse 15, and I heard, and I heard the voice of the Father. Mm -hmm. So now this is, the, 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 and this is almost like a chiastic structure. First it's the right. Father and then the Son, and then it's the Son and then the Father. Right. So that's another interesting aspect right. of it. Yep. And you can see that they're both supporting one another, mm -hmm. and they're both witnesses basically of each other which yeah. is a perfect um, example of a perfect father-son relationship and um if i can just throw mm -hmm. one thing in on that so this this actually kind of like when this the light bulb went off <laughs> you know like you have those epiphany moments where you always know things and then one day the light goes on so i was teaching history 
um, for high school students. I think I was about 19. And um, and I was studying. We had to do the um, the Nicene Creed with Constantine okay, and yeah. all of that. Yeah. So I was trying to figure out, like, how do I explain this to these kids that don't really care a whole <laughs> lot about all the history of the dates? Like, how do I, you know? And what I, is the Nicene Creed? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah right? Exactly. And they, they don't really want to know every detail and won't, won't care. And so, and, and, and that was when the light bulb went on for me where I realized the most damning thing that the Nicene Creed did, the, the, and this is why I think when um, the Father and the Son come to Joseph Smith, Jesus Christ says those creeds are an abomination. Like they are serious because what the Nicene Creed did, among many other things, was it took away the Father and the Son out of the picture. Now there's just a God who's just a spirit, who's maybe just this force. Everywhere, nowhere. Yeah, he's this force in the universe, right, mm -hmm. that you can tap into. And the force. Yeah, he, right. it's the force, right. Yeah, we're, we're no better than Star Wars, right? It, yeah. And the point is, is if you lose the two, mm -hmm. then you lose the plan of salvation. Because right. the plan is that the son, you notice in here, it's always the father he just introduces the son in both of these mm -hmm. phrases that's what he's doing right yeah, yeah. but it's the son is showing us how to be the perfect son right how yeah. to follow the father so that we and know what we're trying to do so the plan for latter-day saints is supposed to be look i'm going to study the son so i know the path to follow yeah to the father but if you don't have two separate beings mm -hmm. there is no how do i study mm -hmm. you know what am i studying maybe god is just super nice out there and it doesn't really matter what i do mm -hmm. right i mean because then you can just like i can make up anything i want well god loves mm -hmm. me so much that it doesn't matter what i do he will just love me no matter and what and i do and if he's just in, a, in this force in the universe is basically right. it really is not a personal god it's right. kind of just a it's just a power out there that right. kind of sort of looks over things and I think that's one of the one of the, the key issues about the first vision which we're actually going to be coming mm -hmm. you know celebrating here the the, the, the mm -hmm. 200th anniversary of the first vision here coming in this year mm -hmm. but basically the um, but but I think one of the things was is that, that that Satan needed to disconnect us from our godly heritage right. that we are literal offspring of God that he looks like us we look like him um, we are his literal, you know, children and so forth. And when we understand that, um, then God becomes a lot more personal to us. But this nebulous, just you know, force in the universe kind of thing, is not very powerful. And that and that disconnection is one of those things that actually, um, in the in, in the doctrine and covenants, I think it's section one twenty one, when the, the when the the, you know, the Lord said basically to Joseph Smith, He said, you know, there's going to be new information that's going to come forward, whether it be one God or many gods, it'll be made manifest, right? Well, that was a pretty big deal in the, you know, in the first vision. You know, there, is, there isn't just one God per se. I mean, there's, there's a father and there's a son, and, right. uh, and, and they have this relationship that is, uh, that is powerful and that we are their descendants. Right, because even if you moved God from being a force in the universe to, oh, you know, he's a person, mm -hmm. even then you're missing all the picture because you're missing That's right. the family. It's a family running the plan of salvation, yeah. essentially, right? Yeah. And we're all supposed to have families, not because, um, you know, a lot of people that don't under have that concept, they're just like, well, we just have families in this life to help <laughs> us, and in the next life, it's gone, right? Yeah. No, the the fa we're supposed to make our families just like God's family. He's a father. We should pattern that after our fathers, just like Jesus yeah. Christ is a son. He's a pattern, and without that, you miss the whole point. Yeah, and and I love these these three chapters are so critical because. This is this is the, the outline. I mean, at least three or four different times in these three chapters, it talks about um, that this is my doctrine. Mm -hmm. This yeah. is this is right. my God. Yeah. Th this is the my doctrine, of doctrine and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you want to know what the doctrine is, right. these have it. Yeah, what and is and the they outline it exactly, and and, 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 it's, and, it's, plain. and it's not clear, yeah. and it's plainly it's said. <laughs> very plainly said. <laughs> exactly. Right. Uh, I, I think that's one thing that's important too. I think it was Brigham Young who talked about. He said. Everything Satan does gets really complicated and confusing. So he yeah. said, if you go to any of those theology schools in his day, he was like, it takes years to learn their doctrine, like to yeah. figure this out and how do you explain this? And he, and he said, everything in God's system is very simple. 
he said there's always more layers so he mm -hmm. said we actually never stop learning it's not like kind of like are. occam's yeah. razor basically right. the, 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 the simplest answer that the, the, the answers the most right. questions basically is probably the one that's true but like he said <laughs> it needs it's got to be simple you know if you have if you have someone come and say well I can't, it's hard for me to explain how god works then they you know don't right know. there they don't know that's why he said right. he loved joseph smith because joseph smith could take things that were so complicated and he's like let me make this so simple there you go yeah. And Brigham Young is like, Just thank you, finally. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> yep. All right, well, that, that's a, a couple things. I, you mentioned that um, this uh, baptism by fire and the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. So so, yes. that, that, so important, the idea that the Holy Ghost is a sanctifier, mm -hmm. and that seems like the scary word, you know, like sanctification. Mm -hmm. Well, all sanctification is talking about is the idea of you know, when you when you purify gold or you purify precious metals, they heat them up to a high level. And Rod knows more about that than I do. But but you heat them up <laughs> and then it will yeah. burn the impurities out. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's the symbolism behind the Holy Ghost. And, and a lot of people are struggling with personal problems. Right. Yeah. Might be being depressed. It might be having a temper. It might be. Who knows? Yeah. Being selfish. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you know, the world's answer is, well, just try the best you can, do what you can do. You know, even Benjamin Franklin, he was trying so hard to be perfect. So he had right. this list and he would just go over it and over it and over it, trying, trying, trying. Try and that's great. Get that impurity out of his life. Right. Yeah. And that's great. And that <laughs> those efforts are huge. But the idea is, how are we ever going to get there? And the, the, the answer is, as this Holy Ghost comes into us and changes. and changes us, actually turns us into a whole new creature. And it's a fiery Where, experience. And it's fire. And so the more we have the Holy Ghost in our life, the Holy Spirit in our life, the more that's burned out of us. And we, we have no more desire mm -hmm. to be selfish. We're a completely Where different person. We aren't depressed anymore which, which we that, aren't yeah, yeah which, which by the way just biologically speaking mm -hmm. but by the, the, the our cells replicate right. themselves and that kind of stuff about every six years all the cells that we were six years ago are, are all gone mm -hmm. right we are now completely different so mm -hmm. I, I wonder if it's that's something that can Symbol. happen yeah. over time you know, this takes time to do it. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you look at Nephi's right. progression as he goes through, you know, from the yes. beginning to all this. And Nephi is progressing and learning and so forth as he's, because he was a young guy he's getting started mm -hmm. off with. I think this is the message that we have to give to the rising generation because too often, right? So let's take, say there's a young man who's struggling with pornography, right? Mm -hmm. To tell him it's okay, everybody does it. It's yeah, just what everybody that. does, and <laughs> it's, not, it's not a big deal. You're still a good person. Um, we still love you, and that's it. Yeah. That's it. You're 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 leaving him in a helpless situation. But if you can, the gospel is a message of freedom and liberation. To sit down and say, well, actually, that is who you are. Do you want to be like that? No. Okay. You can change. You can yeah. change so that years from now or however long it is you are a completely different person and that is not part of you anymore and i think that yeah. is we got to help people realize depression anxiety um, selfishness lying pornography any any addiction food addiction yeah. anything can be overcome and it needs to be overcome and you can change and so one of the things example. too that everybody's always like you know, my whole life through all these lessons and everybody, where, what's good enough, you know, <laughs> or am I good enough? You know, the whole question. Good, like, not, not pure white, but kind of an ivory white. Is maybe, it, maybe is that's it, I mean, good is, enough. is God going to keep me out of the social kingdom for this? Or is this, those questions alone mm -hmm. show that a complete misunderstanding, misunderstanding or a non-understanding even of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's not about are you good enough it's about this is like it says you endure you you feast on the words of Christ you change and this and Brigham Young was very clear and Joseph Smith was very clear this never ends yes we and the more we do that the more we become like God Mm -hmm. And we become, and we become, and we become, and we change. 
And and that process never ends. And 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 why would we do that though? Because mm-hmm. people are like, well, why do I want to just keep changing? <laughs> right? I mean, no, seriously, I was teaching the but, seventeen. But isn't there year olds. a point though where you get to be basically like yeah. God? I mean, isn't I mean once you're once you're once right. your tube is completely mm-hmm. filled with light, I mean Well, fifteen tw- no. well, you never get there though, because <laughs> fifteen, twenty years ago, you know, I was teaching some 17 year olds and and they basically here was their big question they came in and they said well brother started we why would he i even want to do this you know i don't it's think, a really good question you know and i why would i i think i'm happy now i think this other path is more happy than the commandments path so why would i follow the path you're talking about right yeah. and first thing i did is i said well i think Thank you for being honest. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a big deal that they were honest enough to say, hey, I don't I don't get this. Mm -hmm. And I just explained to him, I said, well, here's here's how it is. Okay, God is more. He has more joy than any of us. And I told him, I, I, I said, I can't share exactly how I know this, but I know that God has more joy. Mm -hmm. I know that in his presence there is perfect joy. And so we need to be working towards that. And the the better we do, the happier we're going to be. And so it's a journey of of continually more and more and more Mm -hmm. joy. And I think the key is the the journey to how to do that is simple. I think sometimes people complicate it like, okay, what's the formula? So just to kind of use like a right. hyperbole example. <laughs> I saw a forum, um, I kid you not, and, and there was a forum of Latter-day Saints. They were talking, I, or at least they said they were Latter-day Saints, um, talking about how to gain um, a second comforter experience. They're talking to like a witness. How do I get all, all this? And they were like, well, here's how you do it. Someone on there was like, here's the 10 steps. You start day one, you decide I'm going to get it. So day two, and they have this whole process, like fast this long and then pray for this and then make this piece of paper. Okay, none of that is in the scriptures. It's very, very simple. And I think that's one of the reasons where I, I play, re- reasons why uh, Nephi in here is saying, hey, the path is straight and it's narrow and it's simple and I'm going to speak plainly. This is how you do it. It's a lot of hard work. No one really he, wants he, the he repentance He didn't put the answer. 10 steps in here? <laughs> <laughs> well, because repentance is hard work, right? <laughs> it's kind of, it's a baptism of fire for a reason. Yeah. It's not really, that's yeah. not really fun in terms of pleasure, right? Yeah. That's not exactly but that, a but Disneyland. That's the thing. That, but doesn't but Satan really kind of, um, I mean, he, he dresses up sin and so much fun I right. mean, you know and and, right. and and when you when you really look at it um it's yeah it seems like you know mm-hmm. i don't have all these restrictions the commandments are kind of restricted i can't do this and i can't do that and i can't do this right. you know so forth i mean it seems like a restriction but but the thing is is it's it's the false understanding it's kind of like um you know the, the guardrails on the on right. the on the you know in the canyon highway or whatever mm-hmm. you know i mean yeah you're they, they they restrict you. They restrict you from going off the edge, <laughs> dying, you know. But uh, but the, but that's what the commandments kind of do, is they give you the guidance so that he can you can he can lead you to that happiness, to that joy. And there's a difference between joy and pleasure, and I think that's really key. Um, so if you're raising mm-hmm. kids or you're trying to help someone, don't try to compete with the world you're going to lose every time. If you try, you know, because so many parents are like, okay, how do I make my house funner than the friend's house? Or how do I make our family scripture study just as blitzy as that video game? So they'll want to do come or, follow me or, right. instead of go playing the video game, right? <laughs> so how do I jazz activity, this up? Or, this church activity has yeah. got to be more fun than that church activity. Yes. And that's how well, we're trying to attract Compete. the youth or our kids with the opposite of the gospel message, with the, the gospel view, message yeah. with the right. world, and you're, not, and you're gonna lose counterfeit. every time. Mm-hmm. You'll lose. So we should be attracting them with joy. Can I add one thing? I was yes. just thinking in the context of this. Nephi saw our day. So why is he talking about these things? Because he's gonna recognize these are doctrines we're gonna be struggling with and be needing to hear or maybe are not clarified. And I think that's really important to read the Book of Mormon with that view in mind, thinking, why is Nephi putting this in there? Why does he think I need to know this? And you know, just, it's kind of like when you're... Not just even for us, but also for me. Right. 
And like when why didn't if I put this in there for me specifically, right? It's like when yeah. a parent's talking to their child and they're like, I want you to know something, you know, if the child's like, well, that's cool. Yeah. Like, no, there's a reason why they're trying to tell you <laughs> this is something that, you know, you need. And this is, that's the way they're looking at us because they saw us, they knew who we were yeah. and that's why they put this in here. Yep. I would say to you, I know there's a lot of out there there's a lot of well I want to hear what somebody has to say about the scriptures or I want to hear somebody's commentary on the scriptures or I want to hear but but really this is talking about feasting on the words of Christ you're much better off to go right to the source go right to the Book of Mormon yourself instead of somebody's commentary yeah go right to the doctrine and covenants right to the Pearl of Great Price read what Jesus Christ said I was in a, 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 you know, a council meeting, you know, several years ago, and and I, and they were talking about well, because I was saying let's get people, let's get people reading the scriptures, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and it was interesting because one of the other leaders there was saying well, he goes James, we can't understand the scriptures, the people don't want the scriptures they want somebody talking about the scriptures and that i was I, it broke my heart because i was like let's get a way for people to read the scriptures themselves right. not what somebody's saying because every time you dilute it mm-hmm. you know whether it's me diluting it or someone else <laughs> read right yeah. read what the lord actually said he's the one who knows mm-hmm. no, that, that, that one caveat to that and that is that the basically yeah, I, I mean, I've had so many people who have different understandings than I do, people who were brought up mm-hmm. Jewish, for example. Yeah. Um, I don't have that background and I, and I, you know, and I, didn't, I don't have that knowledge. Everybody has expertise in different areas. So while I, I, I totally agree, basically we have to have the foundation has to be this. Can we learn something from other people who have gone through experiences and share that? And I think the answer to that is, is clearly yes. I, I have. I know in my right. life I'm so grateful that so, if, so many if, people like you guys have right. gone through and you studied certain areas of it because I don't have time. No one has time to study everything. So they right. have to rely on some people who have to be expertise in some areas and then listen to what they're saying. But if it doesn't match right. with what the scriptures say, right. yeah. it, then you have to put it aside. Right. And you need to know the scriptures well enough to be able to test it. Yeah. Right. It, and hopefully that, I mean, I, did, I don't want to be misunderstood. What I was saying is, is yeah. that would be expounding the scriptures, right? Yeah. Like I love to go through Isaiah and just say, hey, this is really simple. Yeah. Mm-hmm. People make Isaiah so hard. It is so simple. Isaiah is... It's so, so, so simple. It really is. We just need to, we need to understand a few basic things Mm -hmm. to be able to get it. But after that, it's simple. So that, Mm -hmm. like you're saying, having somebody give them those basic ideas of how to Mm -hmm. understand Isaiah is good, but let's still read Isaiah. I think the key is getting as close to the source as you possibly can. You know, Um, the imagery that um, my dad always used when we were growing up, and I've used it so many times when like people would come (laughs) and be like, well, what about this book? Like, what about this book? And okay, so if you're if you're getting if you're thirsty, and there's a spring at the top of this hill, and the spring kind of comes down the hill, maybe into like a kind of a pond, and then it goes down a little ways, and some animals are going through it, and then it keeps going down, and then it gets kind of <laughs> through an irrigation ditch, and then we get all the bottom, way to the bottom to a swamp. Where along the way are you going to get your water? And it's hard work to climb up the mountain all the way to the source of the spring. So some people are going to be like, you know what? That irrigation ditch is kind of fine. I, I I'll think just I'm let the water just... come to me. Yeah. And some people are like, I know a couple animals have kind of done their stuff through this, but I'm not going to. It's way, it's way, it's too hot. It's too much work to hike all the way to the top. So, but. But that's the, where the best it's water where, is. That's where the best water is. If you yeah. want it clean and pure and simple and without worrying about what other garbage is in there that you got to right. sift out. And for us in this dispensation, that is yes. Joseph Smith. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So Joseph Smith gave us the Book of Mormon, mm-hmm. the Doctrine and Covenants, the Prologue Pro- Pro- of Price, the Joseph Smith Translation, <laughs> all, right, all of our understanding. Of the scriptures. Of the scripture, all of our understanding. All of it. Comes from Joseph Smith. Through him, yeah. Without mm-hmm. exception. Well, through, in fact, well. the, 
well, through, the, through him from Christ. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah. well, and what we're saying with that is, is he is the revealer. You know, Bruce R. McConkie yeah. always said he is the revealer of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Yes. And that's why it is so critical, this attack on Joseph Smith's character right now, which, of course, like, no, you might not know where you're big on that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, you don't uh, know by now, you will. <laughs> yes. um, but it's so critical because they're trying to say, yeah, this person who was the mouthpiece for Jesus Christ, who gave us all of the scripture, who's giving us the water, Water, this person handing you that cup of water was someone who was involved in the occult, who was a drunkard, who was lazy, who had a temper, but it's no big deal. Tr- drink the water. We still drink the water. Right? Yeah, yeah. And I don't know about no. you, but that does not sound like clean water to me. So, yeah. <laughs> but, so that's why it is so critical, um, this whole battle. And people say, well, maybe it doesn't matter. It, do- it does matter. Well, who people's matters. character matters. Is, uh, yep. Right. It matters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, so let's keep going. There's a couple other quick things here. Um, um, one other the, the thing I was going to mention, the third member of the Godhead, what is the purpose of the Holy Ghost? The purpose of the Holy Ghost basically is to testify of the second member of the Godhead. Right. And what is, and what is his and purpose? The first. To testify of the first member of the Godhead. Mm-hmm. So they all testify of each other in kind of that order. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and even even the the. You know, Joseph Smith, he taught that there's three members of the Godhead. He said, God the first is the creator. So he's the one that everyone descends through, through a lineal, in, you know. Mm-hmm. And then God the second, the redeemer. It's not too hard to figure out who that is. Mm-hmm. And then God the third, the testator or witness. So he's saying the chief, the chief function of the Holy Ghost is to be a testator. There's a really good chapter in um, Doctrines of Salvation, Volume 1. I think it's Chapter 3. And it goes into, Joseph Filling Smith goes into the role of the Holy Ghost, and he explains that most impressions we have actually don't come from the Holy Ghost. They come from the light of Christ, or what some people call mm-hmm. conscience. Or, and, yeah, that, and that's so, something we also wanted to talk about a little bit more. Go ahead. So, okay, yeah. yeah. So let's, let's talk about that yeah. just a little bit more. So, What's the um, difference between So he that? says, Joseph Filling Smith says, even a lot of times when you, so when you have that feeling, I need to go talk to this person, or don't go down that street, or go marry this person even. Mm-hmm. He said, that's not, that's not the Holy Ghost, because the Holy Ghost has a very specific uh, function, and that's why... Um, and that would be the Holy here. Ghost in the ultimate sense. So, so now, the, we were reading in yeah. here, and it was talking about angels mm-hmm. speak by the power, by of, the the power of the Holy Ghost. So we could be, most of the time when our leaders or other people are in there talking about the Holy Ghost, they're talking about actually things that are coming through angels on this side of the veil or the other side Revelation. of the veil. That's when you get the little promptings for, like, this is what you should do, don't. You know, my life's been saved multiple times by mm-hmm. just impressions, and most mm-hmm. people out there, that's mm-hmm. that happens a lot. But, but you have to, but you have to but, be LDS to get those kind of impressions, you, right? You do, you're right. No. <laughs> and so that's important to know. No, you, no, know. you do yeah. not. Yeah. Lots of right? people. Lots of people. There are a lot of Christians and even yes. non-Christian We've people who are believers yeah. who have had amazing right. things because of the light of Christ, which is given to mm-hmm. all right. people. Yeah, right. So. Well, and and they're told. Uh, if you know them, and I've had so many friends and known so many people, they, they're they told who to marry. They pray about it, and they are told that. They're told what job to take. They're told whether to move. They're warned of danger. They're told Those are not things that life. are for just yeah. LDS. So what's the difference here? What are we talking about here mm-hmm. with the Holy Ghost, right? Exactly. Well, what we're talking about, the one thing – that's different than Nephi is talking about or Joseph Smith's talking about is he's saying, look, the Holy Ghost reveals God. That's yeah, what Christ and Jesus Christ and, Jesus Christ and, and the and Father, Father right? right? And so mm-hmm. that's where it's different. Mm-hmm. That's where we have the edge, right, is this idea that we can know the Father yeah. and we can know the sun mm-hmm. and it is that that is an experience you study the world over and and no one mm-hmm. most no one there's a lot of there's false lot, lot, experiences lot, lot of, out there but very few people have a real experience and you know one of the things joseph smith always said is he said could you gaze into heaven for five minutes you would know, know more than 
everything that was ever written on the subject, right? Well, Joseph Smith gazed into heaven. The first vision is much different than what we generally think of it. And when you have all the accounts, you realize, okay, what really happened in the first vision is the father came down and introduced the son. Then the son introduced Nephi and Mormon and other prophets. This is all in the other, I mean, not so specific is what I'm saying, but it's implied in the other accounts. So Joseph Smith said there were many angels. A lot of people go into a faith crisis, right? Because they're like, well, did the father come or did angels come or was the son coming? Right. And they're all different. No, they're all, they're not different. They're just all giving different pieces of one story of of an event Uh, that took hours. uh, Hours. And so Joseph Smith had this experience, the first vision, which is more profound than we've ever thought it was. Mm-hmm. No one, if you added up every other experience, every other person in this dispensation has, ha- ha- has had, it doesn't even hold a candle mm-hmm. yeah, to what pretty. Joseph Smith knew after the first vision. And then it says uh, in verse 7 of uh, chapter 32, he says, uh, he says, I cannot say more, the Spirit stoppeth my utterance. And I'm left to mourn because of the unbelief of those who don't want to do this. And he mm-hmm. says that those who um, will not seek, search knowledge nor understand great knowledge. Mm-hmm. Right. So those who won't even look for it or, or those who, if you're not looking for it, you're, you're clearly not going to understand it. So you right. have to have this desire mm-hmm. to, uh, to want to know more. Right. And then he, talk, then he says to pray always. That's kind of how you, how you get it. Can I add something with that? It, 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 there's <laughs> all, all the time, I think in life, there's all these, I call them duh statements, right? Just duh. things that are, <laughs> but you, sometimes you just have to think through the duh statements to realize, wait a minute, like, wait a minute, have I really thought about that? And one, one thing that a lot of times we, I think all the time people are like, oh yeah, there's a lot of scriptures we don't have that when we're more righteous. Okay, well, let me just say the duh statement, <laughs> like really bluntly, right? Uh-huh. We don't have a lot of scripture because we're wicked. Yeah. Like just, just, I'm just going to be the controversial one to like, just say it that simple. And I, I when yeah. I say we, you know, just the pe- as, a, as people, a people, that's, you know, right. and so I think, I think if we kind of take some time to ponder that and think, okay, what are we doing? You know, Brig- um, Ezra Tapp Benson got up in conference and said the church is under condemnation for not taking seriously the Book of Mormon, Mormon. same case in Joseph Smith's day. Um, just thinking, okay, what are we doing individually and collectively as a people to help remove that, to gain more knowledge and realizing, you know, I, I, you hear a lot of people are like, well, we have so much more scripture than anybody else. And like, that no. any other, this is what you will <laughs> hear actually, is people will say, well, we have more than it, there ever has been. Well, that's right. not true at all. So they knew more, far more in the days of Joseph Smith than we do today. They knew far more in the days of Abraham uh-huh and Adam, and Shem, and Melchizedek. These are all statements. This, And so that may sound like a heretical thing to say. Actually, this is coming from Bruce McConkie, Joseph mm-hmm. Fielding so Smith, many statements. Brigham Joseph Young. Smith, Brigham Young. I could take statements from all of those folks saying what I just said. So we can right? see it as like so, a dis- discouraging thing, or we can say, wow, there's a lot to look I, forward to. <laughs> and the reason I'm bringing that up is, is Nephi here is saying... I cannot say more. In other words, Nephi knew more, a lot more Mm -hmm. than what he is in here in this Book of Mormon. Mormon, two thirds of what he wrote, what we're going to use during the millennium, right? (laughs) Those scriptures that we're going to use during the millennium have already been written. They were written by Nephi and Mormon and all these folks, right? Mm -hmm. And frankly, why do we not have any of the writings of Joseph? Ancient Joseph. Yeah, we have. It's a, because we're not worthy to have them. Why do we not have the writings of Abraham, and Enoch, Enoch yeah. and Melchizedek, and Adam, mm-hmm. and Seth, <laughs> and Abel, and go on and on and on for two hours? Right. The reason we don't have those writings is we're not ready for them. So why are we saying that? We're not beating ourselves up. We're saying, let's start studying. Right? Let's He's change. saying, Nephi's saying right here. He's saying, <laughs> for they will not search knowledge. He's saying, if you guys would just start searching, you could have the experience. Like Nephi saw probably the whole history of the earth. If you go through those opening chapters in the Book of Mormon, he's yeah. seeing the Reformation. He's seeing the Dark Ages. Yeah. He's seeing the history of his people. Anyway. So you see, we can, we can get more and more. I'm, I'm just thinking about this for, from the standpoint of that uh, we can individually learn more and more and more. Mm-hmm. But right. we're still being held back 
as a people because right. we don't have the two thirds mm -hmm. of the sealed plates, mm -hmm. and we don't have all those histories that you just named. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, because uh, because of, of collectively we are not ready to receive those. And mm -hmm. if you receive something and then you don't do it, it's don't even it. worse yeah. for you. Totally. Yes. So right? it's a merciful thing. Yeah. So it's kind of a yeah. merciful thing. But yeah. at the same time, it's kind of slowing us down. So <laughs> let's, right. let's let's change that. Yeah. You know, a lot of people say, well, I'm so hampered because I don't have these other scriptures. Well, let's right. first study these scriptures. Because there is so much. Because there is so much. And then that study, like hardly anybody's ever studied the Joseph Smith translation. It's mm -hmm. so profound. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, people are always, you know, asking questions, you know, and, and will quote, well, jo did you know that Joseph Smith said, blah, 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 right? Yeah. No did you know he said no this? Idea. And almost every question... Well, those are all his teachings that almost no one has ever studied. Right. So that's another great place to get information, you know, is from all the different teachings that Joseph. And I think with this, um, it's not just about studying, it's about living. Because the Pharisees knew right. more scripture than any of us here in those room. Like they could just, they knew in, terms, down of, to the, to the in terms of intellectually, you know? they yeah. could walk in a room and be like, Isaiah, right. blah, 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 and Isaiah, blah, 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 you know, and, but they, didn't know Killed anything. the Son of God. Right. Talking so, about not seeing him when he's in front. Yeah, they right? blew it. Right? Yeah, they blew it. So yeah. it's really important. Are we living it? And are we living righteously? Because otherwise, it's not really going to know matter. Right. Yep. All right, we need to move on to the last couple of pages. So this is uh, page 98 in the annotated edition of the Book of Mormon. Uh, we are on, uh, this is the Second Nephi chapter 33. Is that, and it begins with, he says, Nephi says, I can't write even a, a, a part of what was, was taught among my people. So we clearly know that they knew a lot more. His people knew a lot more than what he's giving us here. Right. Okay, and, um, and, and he's just you know, talking about that. Um, let me see. Then he keeps, he keeps talking about, interestingly enough, um, several times he talks about my people. In verse 1, he talks about my people. Then he says, um, um, let's see. In verse 3, he talks about my people. In verse 4, he talks about my, my people. people. In verse 7, he talks about my people. But wait a minute. Might be but, important. But, uh, but this whole history, he saw what was going to happen. Didn't all his people get wiped out? Right. And so so if he's put it into this book with the intent that this is going to this is going to come to the people in the latter days, mm -hmm. who are his people? Mm -hmm. Nephi, through all of his teachings in 2 Nephi 25 and here in this lesson and other lessons, Jacob, when he's talking to his people, you know, you have all these places where they're talking about their descendants in the last days. And when they're praying right here, when you read in verse 30 or chapter 33 here, mm -hmm. he's talking about, look, I'm praying for my, my descendants. I am praying for my people. I am so, you know, some, of them, some of them Lord. are going to live. They're going to make it through that final battle. Well, so right. Well, so so at the end, what we've forgotten is that in the Book of Mormon it explains before the wicked are destroyed, the righteous are always let out. Yeah. Can I? Yeah. So that that scripture is actually um, we'll be reading that next week uh, in the in Jacob, Jacob chapters, yeah. and 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 Jacob says he's talking to the Nephites. He says the time speedily cometh that except ye repent, the Lamanites are going to possess the land of your inheritance. And the Lord God will lead away the righteous out from among you. So if you think about history, right? What happened when Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed? Mm -hmm. Lot and his family left. Um, Abraham left. Lehi left. Um, so many other places when the city or a Mulek group of left. people, Mulek, yeah. when they're ready to be destroyed, the Lord says, okay, I'm going to save the righteous people and they leave, they get out, they hightail it out of there, right? And so, and then the Lord always starts a new civilization with them to kind of to restart right. the cycle. So Jacob says, that's gonna, what is what's gonna happen with the Nephites? The yeah. righteous are gonna leave, which I mean, put yourself for a second in a Nephite shoes, okay? So you're a Nephite living at the time, let's just say of Mormon. And you're sitting, because we know there were a lot of righteous Nephites, because Mormon is writing letters to them about charity and about infant baptism. So there was a congregation of righteous Nephites. So you're sitting here, you know the prophecies, you know everyone around you is so wicked, you know that the whole civilization is going to be destroyed. So you have a couple options. A, you say, you know what, let's just bury our heads in the sand and let's just, we're all going to die. 
So wife and or, kids. Or, or I'm gonna go and, down with the ship. And grandkids, <laughs> like I'm just gonna just yeah. run out there to the Lamanites, you know, like, like, <laughs> right? Or yeah. B, you say, you know what? There's all these ships going everywhere. We're gonna hop on a ship and we're gonna we, we're gonna right. take an extended vacation. For Mormon and Moroni, <laughs> I think it makes a lot of sense that they would send their their families. Yeah. To a different place and yeah, for the earlier nephites mm-hmm. we we have the records of hagoth it was Hagoth, if you yeah, hagoth maybe. and if you go yeah. look at the records in there you're seeing it's many thousands of people, people and leaving. big ships are leaving yes well did that just happen at one time and yeah. why was that yeah. so important to be in the record? Well, well that of course it wouldn't happen twice. That, they, that yeah. was actually recorded, but how many were right. not recorded? recorded? How many of them did not even know? Right. When, when, when the righteous are basically being told by the Lord directly mm-hmm. to, to get out of Dodge, so to speak, right. mm-hmm. um, they don't necessarily go, go tell the prophet, hey, by the way, we're right. leaving. Mm-hmm. So, and where, where did the ocean currents take everyone? Is the great <laughs> question. Well, mm-hmm. you know, the easiest place for most of them that we've, you know, in our research is it, it leads you right to northern Europe. Because the archaeological records. That is if it's in the eastern contact. United States. That's yeah. in the eastern, or in the Great well, Lakes. Yeah, even, Great Lakes. We actually even have some friends who are like, I don't buy any of this Heartland stuff. I'm full on mezzo. And even them are like, yes, if you take off even from South America, it's, it's going to be pushing you that up way that direction. Too. So that's an interesting thing. Now, we also have records of when, and, and I think we, I don't know if we mentioned this before, but like when he were Jay Grant, yes. when he, dedicated japan Mm -hmm. okay so that dedication is beautiful and we're working on a documentary on that but but basically it explains he was very overcome with the spirit and said that those people were nephites Mm -hmm. not all of the japanese but there was a remnant led Mm -hmm. to japan Mm -hmm. so the same joseph f smith was very clear that there was a remnant led to other Polynesian places and New Zealand, right? And so other leaders of the church have felt impressed from time to time to say, hey, I feel like uh, the Lehites or the Nephites or the Lamanites were led Mm -hmm. to different places across the world. Which makes sense because in 1 Nephi, when Lehi gets the brass plates, he sits down and he has this spiritual experience. It's in 1 Nephi chapter 3. And he says that he prophesies, Lehi prophesies that the brass plates would eventually be given to his nations. people and his people would be among nations, kindreds, tongues, and people. Mm-hmm. Well, that covers a lot of territory. That's not mm-hmm. just a few tribes. Small... And he's saying the brass plates are going to go to all of these of my children who are going to be all over the world. So, so why does that matter? Well, I think it matters a lot True. because Nephi here in, in 2 Nephi 33 He's saying, look, I'm praying, I'm pleading with the Lord to help my my kids and my descendants. They clearly weren't all destroyed. Right. And they're literally all over the earth. They're mm-hmm. literally all over the earth. Yeah. And, and and he's promised here in the Book of Mormon that the Book of Mormon's gonna come forth by by a Nephite. <laughs> That's second mm-hmm. Nephi chapter three, that Joseph Smith would have the blood of the Nephites in him. So the Book of Mormon comes forth by a Nephite. You know, it's interesting, who are the three Nephites ministering to? Yes. So it's interesting, Joseph Fielding Smith and others have said, hey, the three Nephites were meant to minister to their people. That was their mission. Their mission right. in the last days is to work with their own Nephite so people. So where do you have three Nephite experiences? Now, nowadays, we're so scholarly and so, you know, academic that we're like, well, there's these myths about, about these the three, three Nephites, Nephites that we don't believe anymore. Showing up. Oh, the, yeah, they're the showing up all the, over the place. Well, we're not talking time. about those, like the showing up to change a tire. Not those. Yeah, right. <laughs> we're not talking about those. We're talking, we're about, talking about real <laughs> legitimate experiences accounts. where, yeah. like, Joseph Smith or Brigham Young or, or oh, you mean like the David Whitmer's account or, or you know with the, so with, like, the, uh, with the three guys that uh, they they walked out and he, he, he right he, he didn't to go say pick, in that experience yeah 
he didn't thing. say in that experience that those were the three Nephites. Right. So we're not right. saying. But it was interesting. And, he said there's three guys that were out there yeah. were placing the field, basically, mm-hmm. uh, right. so that he could take off and go help Joseph. Well, we know um, Mary Elizabeth Rollins Leitner, who mm-hmm. was um, one of the wives of Joseph Smith. She, her family had an experience with one of the three Nephites and Ephraim Hanks and Brigham Young. And there were a lot of early saints who said, yeah, they were working with us. Yeah. So why are they working with all of these Anglo-Saxon pioneers <laughs> if, if they're supposed to be working with the Nephites? Like, did they just get distracted right. or <laughs> are they actually working with Or were the people, people Nephites? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. right. That's what, that, that reminds me of in, in Doctrine and Covenants in Section 3, the Lord basically tells us that the purpose, why, they, why these plates here were mm-hmm. preserved mm-hmm. in the first place. And, mm-hmm. and, and in verse 16 of, uh, the, this is uh, Doctrine and Covenants Section 3, he says, um, my, my work shall go forth uh, because the knowledge of the Savior has come to the world through the testimony of the Jews, i.e. the Bible. Even so shall the knowledge of the Savior come unto my people. And then he kind of lists them here. He says, mm-hmm. the Nephites and the Jacobites and the Josephites and the Zoramites through the testimony of their fathers. Well, that means that there's Nephites, Jacobites, Josephites, and Zoramites who are still alive today mm-hmm. And not this only is that, but their okay. fathers, that's, that's their Alma fathers. and Helaman and Captain Moroni. Absolutely. That, those are their fathers. That's right. So that means their kids. Their yeah. fathers right. wrote the Book of Mormon. That's right. Yeah. And, but he says, and also the testimony shall come to the knowledge of the Lamanites and Lemuelites and Ishmaelites right. who dwindled in unbelief because of the iniquity of their fathers. And he says, and for this very purpose have these plates been preserved, which contain these records. And, and, and that's the promises of the Lord mm-hmm. to all of those particular people that he just mentioned. That means that all of them made it through mm-hmm. the final battles and all that kind of right. other things that were going on. So this is, there's a lot of people from the Book of Mormon all over the world mm-hmm. um, that are, are coming through. And I, and I love the, uh, the fact that Joseph Smith is kind of like the fusion, if you will. Right. <laughs> but based on your research, I mean, you know, right. and, and then other statements from the prophets that, that Joseph Smith was a direct descendant of not only Christ, but mm-hmm. also a direct descendant of Nephi. Mm-hmm. That puts Joseph Smith as a unique, unique position to be right. basically, you know, an actual descendant of both to bring the stick of Judah and the stick of um, this, or, or e- Ephraim. Ephraim. Mm-hmm. Ephraim. And the Josephites. Yeah. yeah. All together. And then the, look at the pouring out of the uh, of the knowledge that came from that. Oh, this is fantastic. Okay, so we, we need to wrap this up, though. So a couple quick things. If you have the Antioch edition of the Book of Mormon in, in, uh, on, on page 98, at the bottom, it, it, it has that uh, that Second Nephi 32, 3, that's also used in the mm-hmm. uh, Scripture's Legacy film. And also, we have a beautiful uh, image here by David Lindsley. This is a Mormon in the Heart Man. Basically, you can see that on page 99. This is a remake of a, another, a previously famous mm-hmm. photo that had, or not photo, but a painting that had a lot of interesting things like jaguar skins and, <laughs> and so forth, which are never mentioned in the Book of Mormon, and, and big pyramids in the background, which yeah. are never mentioned in the Book of Mormon. So uh, so David Lindsley, my, my dear friend uh, David Lindsley, he's an amazing artist. Right. He's actually yes. the one that did the... Uh, the Joseph Smith painting that was yes. on the first on the front cover it's of the favorite. Joseph Smith manual, mm-hmm. and so forth. But he actually redid this painting, and you can see some wonderful things there that he did with this with this painting. He's got him in. Uh, he's got a, a Hebrew um, like a. Um, what my favorite is the mark of the mound builders. Yeah, he's got he's got the the, the Yod Heh Vah, mm-hmm. um, and, it, and, and then he's he's wearing moccasins. In the background is a fall scene, mm-hmm. you know, and so forth. And he's in a he's in like a tent situation there. Um, and it, he's got a buffalo skin that he's sitting on instead of a jaguar, right. which again, you know, they talked about migrating beasts, you know, and right. And I, I would like to put a buffalo. plug in for David Lindsley's art, mm-hmm. just yes, because just, it's awesome. He's been very generous through the years. He's let us use mm-hmm. his art. Yes, he has the gr- hands down, in my opinion, the greatest uh, paintings of Joseph Smith yeah. and yeah. and several things and mm-hmm. and and. It's definitely if if you're not familiar, you know, for people out there, if they're not familiar with his art. So here too, just a couple of things that we kind of skipped over, and just really fast in yes. in chapter thirty three, where it's talking about, you know, he's talking about my people. We touch that, but but in verse four, it says, "It maketh known unto them their fathers," you know, again, mm-hmm. right? So this book. This Book of Mormon is written so we can know our 
Nephite fathers, our Nephite forefathers. That's what that says so clear. And Nephi really, his prayers were fulfilled. He's praying for his kids. And then here he says, I have charity in verse 7 for my people. He says, I have charity for the Jews in verse 8. And he says, I, 9, I have charity for the Gentiles. Mm-hmm. Right? So there's three major groups. Again, and this is mentioned in many places. We already talked about this in the Book of Mormon and other places. But we have the Nephites, the Jews, and the Gentiles as three great groups in the latter day that need the Book of Mormon. So who is excluded there on the earth? Well, what people right, are there right. that aren't, aren't part of that group? There's people in who, these groups they're, they're among not, not, everyone not, all not, over Not the, the Nephites, world. not the Jews, and not right. the Gentiles. It covers everybody, if I understand that correctly, which basically means it's, 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 it's he has developed a love like our Heavenly Father has for mm-hmm. every single one of us as his, his offspring, his children. Mm-hmm. And I think that the reason why I, I brought that particular you know, thing up is because of the fact that um, you know, we are all his children. And that's right. what the first vision tells us, is that we are his direct descendants. And the other thing is, is just like Enos, um, you know, when, when he, after he wrestled with God, basically, and he had that, uh, that overwhelming love, not only for his own people, but also for the Lamanites yep. and everyone. When, yep. you, when you become like God is, you cannot have hatred in your heart for, for anyone. anyone. Sometimes that's hard for me on the political spe- spectrum. <laughs> you know? well, I think even But I'm trying to learn to get over that just like Enos did. Yeah. Right. And it's, so here we have, you know, in, in, in case, right in verse 10, it says, And now, my beloved brethren, and also Jew, and then in case there's anybody out there that's not of Israel, he says, and all ye ends of the earth. So that's covering everyone, <laughs> right? I mean, right? Everybody out there to the ends of the earth. We're all covered. Okay, we're covered. And again, I, I do think it is so important what you're saying at the end of the day. You know, I tell my kids this over and over. You know, our family has a lot of times criticized because certain people say, well, your kids spend all their time helping other people, you know, and they're wasting their lives. They're not out there just having fun like everybody else, right? Not experiencing some of the things that other people are experiencing, you know. But I always tell them, I say, look, at the end of the day, what really matters, what you're going to care about is how many people did I help? Yes. You know, what else really matters? How many people did I help? And what did I do to lift? And what did I do to build? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, nothing else really matters. (laughs) 